Okay, well, let's go ahead and kick it off. Some other people are going to come in, I'm sure. Uh, that's how these things tend to roll. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks, everybody, for coming. My name is Jeff Everhart. I work for WP Engine on and the developer relations team. And we're focused on our headless ecosystem and our Atlas product line. Um, and so today's presentation is called Building with Headless WordPress in a Block-Based World. Uh, this is a version of a talk I gave at a conference called Decoupled Days uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then also a version of a talk that I got rejected from WordCamp. Um, so maybe if, if you're coming from LinkedIn, I see lots of new faces here. So thanks for joining us. I've got some uh, shout outs at the end of ways you can get a little bit more involved in our community if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I like to start off with this lame Jerry Seinfeld joke. What's the deal with blocks anyway? Because if you're in the WordPress space, which we all are, it seems like blocks are all that anyone wants to talk about nowadays. Um, and for a long time, the, the Gutenberg editor and blocks were something that didn't really work well with headless. And this is a space where WP Engine and a bunch of our open source partners have invested a ton of time and effort over the last, I don't know, year, two years to really iron out some of the rough edges and try and make this experience way better for people. At the same time, Automatic uh, and WordPress VIP have also come out with some solutions based around REST. So like, like I said, just the ecosystem is in a much more stable place, better place than it was a little while ago. But how I've structured today's presentation is pretty much we're going to start at like the very foundation of blocks, look at what they are, how they're built, and then sort of work our way up from there to how we get those things out and use them in decoupled applications. Um, and so that involves like the data fetching, but it also looks at some of the application code and like how do we map blocks to components in a reasonable way that we don't want to pull our hair out? And then at the end, I've got a bunch of like really kind of cool, exciting things to look at that are maybe on the horizon for our teams and uh, just sort of where the space is going. Um, so hopefully we have some time to look at that stuff at the end. But definitely a very interactive presentation. If you've got a, if you've got a question, you know, definitely pop it in chat. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. This is all being recorded. So anything you say will be posted on YouTube. So just keep that in mind. And if you don't want, want that, pop it in chat and I'm happy to read it. Um, so to get started, I pulled just kind of some excerpts from the block editor handbook to help give us some context, right? Because I think we, we talk about blocks and we don't always know exactly what we mean. And now as Gutenberg evolves, right, the meaning of blocks is becoming something different than something that's just inside of the block editor or, you know, the page editor. So the block is an abstract term that's used to describe these units of markup that when they're composed together, create this content or layout of a web page. And I think the idea behind this, at least when, when it was initialized, was that it was going to sort of replace a bunch of different ways that people were building with current WordPress themes. Like we're no longer going to really use short codes or custom HTML. And like we can sort of centralize around this block abstraction so that we could create a single and consistent API and user experience. Um, and so this slide, maybe not as relevant since we're a WordPress focus group, but like this is, when we talk about blocks, there are a lot of different meanings of blocks. And what I'm gonna be particularly focused on today is actually what's being created inside of the block editor, right? So we've got the whole FSE site editor idea. We're not, we're gonna just kind of ignore that for right now and focus on specifically the block editor, right? I'm editing the blocks of a particular page or post. And so we've got these different sections. Over on the right-hand side, we've got like the block details and we can also access our post details. Inside that middle pane is obviously where we get that real-time preview. And then over on the left-hand side is where we have our block inserter. So this is how we uh, pick and choose different blocks that we want to actually insert into the canvas. Um, and again, this is gonna take on a whole different context as Gutenberg shifts from focusing on the block editor to the site editor and other parts of the WordPress interface, like more parts are becoming quote unquote blockified. So let's dig into blocks for a second and talk about what those are. So again, I mentioned they're abstractions on top of HTML and they're sort of like components. And all of these blocks get saved still in the post content uh, column in, in the post table in something called block markup. So WordPress has a number of core blocks, but then developers can also create their own custom blocks. And now block markup is something that I think is pretty important for us to understand because this is basically, you know, when we think about what this looks like, 
and gets saved as in the database. This just gets saved as a blob of HTML. And so what blocks are supposed to do is add a little bit of structure to that HTML. And they've chosen to do that using this block markup convention. So this uses HTML comments to basically annotate the structure of our blocks. And you can see here, for example, where we have this WP list block, we have like almost this JSON like syntax inside of uh, this comment that stores those block attributes. Um, and that's really how, how we sort of make these usable. And so our challenge as people developing headless app applications is because they've chosen to like, instead of storing this as a JSON representation or something like that, we have to then parse this block markup uh, to make it usable inside of our headless apps. So that's how blocks get saved. Let's take a look at what, uh, the, like the anatomy of a block. So what is a block and what, what does it do? Um, and so this is an example of a custom block that I created just using the basic like WordPress create block script. And this is what it scaffolded out, scaffolded out for you. And there are really three main uh, sections that I'll talk about here. So the first we have is a block.json file. And this stores some metadata about the block and its attributes, its values, you know, what type of block it is. Is it a layout block? Is it a content block? And then we have these two other files, right? This is, there's an edit.js file which contains a React component uh, that gets rendered when the user's editing the post. So like if they're in the, the block editor, they see what's inside of your edit.js file. That's how they interact with it. The save.js file uh, contains a React component that basically gets rendered and serialized um, and stored in that post content uh, in the block markup. So this is what a block.json file looks like. And here we can see there's a bunch of different stuff. Like, right, there's schema, name, versioning, title. There's different categories that you can basically attach to your block so that it appears differently in the inserter. Um, but a lot of what I think matters to us as people who are developing headless apps are these attributes, right? These are the individual pieces of data that we want to pull out and display in our headless applications. So in this example of a custom block, I have two different attributes here. I have a message that's a type string and then a background color that is also a type string. And there's a couple of different ways that we can source these attributes. So we saw block markup already. Um, and we can pull attributes from those sort of JSON-like data structures inside the comments, or we can also actually say, hey, this attribute isn't stored inside of the, the comment delimiter. It's stored inside of the blocks HTML, and then I give it a selector, right? So if I have an H3 with a message inside of it, the, the block, when it, when it renders and when you spin up the editing interface is going to know to go and find the H3 tag inside of your blocks markup and sort of pull that data out for you. So a lot of flexibility in sort of where you want to store that data, how you want to construct uh, your block. Um, and then there's a bunch of other options too. Like you could do some validation here and add enum. So there's some kind of cool things that you can do on the, on the CMS editor side uh, to make this look nice and usable for your clients. Um, so this is what the edit.js file looks like. Um, and again, this gets rendered when somebody's actually editing the post. Um, so when, when I go to the block editor and I pull up my block, this is what they'll see. Um, and WordPress actually has a sort of own Gutenberg editor component library that you can see I've actually pulled a couple of components from there that uh, basically act as our controls, right? So I've got this text control component. You can see here that this is all just a React component and it takes in you know, these props, attributes, and this set attributes function. And basically when this text control changes, I you know, get the new value and set the attribute for the message. Um, same thing I'm doing with this color pick picker down here. Um, and so that's essentially how, how this part of it works, right? I, I kind of create my own editing interface that has its own sort of local block state that you can update and, and use to save attributes back to the block when it, when it serializes out to HTML. Now, save.js is typically a lot simpler uh, because we're not really editing anything, right? We're just rendering the thing that we should see on our front end web page. Um, and so that's what's happening here. You can see uh, this really kind of only gets this attributes. And again, these are all simplified examples. So you can do a lot more complex stuff here. Um, and then I'm just using those attributes to set this background color, to set that message. Um, and then that essentially gets rendered and is what gets saved uh, as a part of your post content. And so we can see here that this is sort of what that custom block looks like in action. You know, I've got my editing interface over here. We've got our text control 
We've got our color control. Um, and then this is sort of what the uh, block markup looks like for that particular block. Uh, for the background color, since we didn't tell it where we wanted to source the attribute from, it assumes that we want to store it inside of this block delimiter, this comment delimiter, where, uh, for example, the message, I said, hey, I'm using this H3 element, and that's where I put it inside of my save.js. So that's where that particular piece of data gets saved. And when I load back up the edit screen, it finds the H3, extracts the data from there, and then you know loads that into uh, my text control component. Um, and then that's sort of what this block looks like on the front end, right? It was sort of basic. We had a div with some background color and then a message um, on there. Um, so in addition to that, I know a couple of you have said like you did some stuff with ACF. And so ACF also offers a uh, alternative authoring pattern for blocks. Now this is much more based around PHP um, and does a lot of stuff for you in, in a much in a much simpler way. Like, right, so the way that this works, we're still using a block.json file to register the block, but we add in this ACF key, which ACF then uses to, to do some stuff for you in the background. Um, and here we're actually using a PHP render template to render our, um, our block instead of a JS file. And, you know, there's a couple of, and then what, what happens at this point, right? So we, we've sort of registered our block. Um, and then what we do is we, instead of, like I said, making that edit.js file where I had to basically hand construct my editing interface, I can come out to ACF. I can create a field group of all of the different data I want with this particular types that I want. And then I can basically set to show that on a particular block. So I'm showing that field group if the block is equal to testimonial. And then we get kind of get an editing interface that looks like this. Um, where we have, you know, our, our template being rendered, our PHP template being rendered. And then over here, ACF handles creating that editing interface for us. So it simplifies a lot of that process for people who are coming from traditional WordPress and don't really want to mess around with the JavaScript, which may not be uh, most of you all obviously come into like a headless JavaScript focused presentation, but it offers some really nice affordances. For me, it was way easier to just say, oh, let me go in and boop, boop, boop. I want this field group. And then you know, that, that gets displayed for me. And I actually found out that this meme was vampires from some Twilight movie and doing research for this. So today I learned that. I don't know how many of y'all knew that. Um, but we get really nice block editor interfaces without JavaScript. Uh, and then this is sort of how it gets saved. And so ACF sort of does something a little bit different because we're not actually specifying the block's attributes. It kind of just has its own way of sourcing attributes. So we get this data attribute and then that just stores like a JSON blob of all of your different fields. Um, so right now that's kind of different. And I think with a lot of the different ways with at least some of the new development that we're doing, this part of the block sourcing stuff is incomplete. So like I'll tease some stuff that's coming down the pipeline. Um, but if you wanna use like the new content blocks plugin and all of the new stuff that I'm about to show you, this part's still kind of in the works and we'll take a look at a PR that Jason Ball opened to, to do this. Um, so just a little bit different. Um, it makes referencing types tricky. There are some things that don't work as well right now because ACF, you know, has the ability to essentially reference other fields or other content types in WordPress. So it's not just storing a string, it's storing a reference to an image that, you know, might have a URL that we've got to go get. Um, so we're still kind of working through some of those last minute things, but the, the situation is looking really, really cool uh, in the next three months, I would say. Um, so at that point, like those are kind of the ways we make blocks. That's sort of what WordPress does on its end, but how does that impact us as headless or decoupled app developers, right? So since I've been in the headless space, this is pretty much how most people do it. I just get post.content from GraphQL and then I dangerously set some inner HTML or you know use VHTML or whatever directive you want in your framework to dump all of that HTML onto a page. And then I kind of deal with styling that in my front end application or import some styles from WordPress. Uh, so other strategies in the past have also involved using something like React HTML parser, where I know a couple of large sites where they'll take the content they get back from WordPress, parse through it on their own and map that from, you know, those HTML elements to new ones, and they get really nice clean elements that way. Um, but obviously that takes a lot of work. 
And then I know a couple of you all have mentioned like using previous iterations of plugins. So I think there was like the WP GraphQL Gutenberg plugin uh, by Peter Pristis uh, and a couple of other attempts to sort of source stuff from Gutenberg. And I think when that plugin was developed, the, we had way more limitations. So somewhere in the last year to two years, uh, WordPress core has added in what's called a server side registry. So basically it takes all of those block.json files and creates an endpoint where now I can go get information about all of the blocks that are registered on my WordPress instance. Um, that didn't happen in the last plugin. And so what had to happen was the, the Peter Pristis plugin like loaded a post and every time you loaded the post, it would like get a list of all the blocks you were using and all the configurations and sort of save them in the options table. And so obviously that wasn't really scalable. It was kind of like a workaround, but now at least we have the server side registry so we can do a bunch of this stuff more easily. But that is definitely a gotcha. There are still some ways that you can register. You can still register blocks without a block.json file and you could still register blocks just with the block editor. Right. So that anything like that isn't going to come through as a block entity in GraphQL or really in the rest solution that I'm going to show you. Um, so just something to think about. Um, and, and I've got like somebody asked me to how would I customize a, a, a core native block? And it was really involved. Right. We had to do some JavaScript stuff and then I had to in PHP unregister the block and then re-register it with a different with a different or an additional attribute. So there's some stuff in the background that has to happen. Um, okay, so that's how we used to do stuff. And like, yeah, cool. That for, for a lot of stuff, this is still totally fine. But what we were seeing is a lot more people wanted a higher level of customization. They wanted to be able to use their own components um, and not just dump a bunch of HTML from WordPress in there and you know wanted to do their own thing. So hopefully this gets us at least a couple of steps in that direction. Um, and so that's what we need to do, right? We need to take the block markup that gets stored like this and translate that into something that looks like this, into JSON data. Um, and so there are two ways to do that. And this is kind of where I'm going to like exit out of the presentation. So I appreciate y'all putting up with all the background, but I really wanted to make this as foundational as I could for anybody who's going to watch this resource as a recording. Um, but so this is sort of what this looks like in uh, WP GraphQL using an extension called content blocks. Um, here on our posts, anything that implements the editor, we get this editor blocks, uh, you know, node here. And then we can come down here and um, specify different properties on those editor blocks that we want to pull out. So name, CSS classes, rendered HTML. Um, and then we can see we're passing in flat true here. And that's kind of because this is... Uh, one of those WP GraphQL conventions where like, obviously blocks can be, can have inner blocks and can be nested to like the nth degree. Um, so what this does is this basically generates you a flat list of the blocks, which is much faster for the server to process. And then your client application sort of uses this client ID and the parent client ID on the other end to reconstruct those into a hierarchy. Um, which we're going to do with a block with with some components that we've created uh, that the Faust team has created. But here we can see that each each of our core blocks, each of the blocks that we register using the server side registry, gets its own uh, GraphQL type. So core paragraph has certain things that appear on it and only it, and you know it get, gets all the attributes. It knows all of the different things that you can do with it. So it's really nice from that perspective because again, we we with GraphQL we get this sort of type safety. Uh, through this. And if you want to use this with uh, more advanced tools like GraphQL code gen or GenQL or something like that, you could definitely do this and get some really nice type stuff here. But we can see that, right? I'm getting core paragraph with the attributes. Um, and we can see that here. This is content. We can see down uh, right here is our um, custom block. And I actually didn't specify anything on that, but I could be pulling attributes out of that. So that's sort of what this looks like. And we'll, we'll again, I'm going to do a couple more slides and then we'll eject and look at some code and stuff like that. Um, so that's what this looks like. This is sort of what the future of the ACF block stuff looks like. Um, once the re-architecture of the WP GraphQL ACF extension is complete. Uh, so that extension has been re-architected to work with all of the new features of ACF since ACF 6.2, which is custom post types, custom taxonomies. It already works really well with that stuff. Uh, but now we're rounding that out with the ACF block piece so that you can get really, again, that, that type safety, 
all the way up and down your ACF blocks using the field groups and tapping into that and, you know, actually getting like the images. And here you can see that, like I get this media item connection edge type that has specific properties on it. And so again, should be really predictable, really safe to use. Um, and so if you're not into the WP GraphQL land, which I suggest you should be, um, there is an alternative option that Automatic has been working on and uses on their WordPress VIP client sites. And that is just called the Block Data API. And basically this is just a REST endpoint that, you know, goes, parses your blocks this, in pretty much the same way that uh, WP GraphQL content blocks does and just returns you this. You know, the downside is you don't get any of the type safety in the IDE or anything like that. You just get back this array of blocks that are, that are sourced like this. Um, so let me go ahead and now I think, yeah, let's, let's look at some examples and we can come out here and mess around. And before I do that, anybody got any questions or from here and that, is there anything like y'all definitely want me to go over and feel free to throw them in the chat, which WP version out of the registry? That is a great question. I don't know. It's been out for like, I don't know, Terry might know better than I do. Like we've been plotting this for, I mean, this content blocks plugin for a year and a half now, maybe. So I would say two or three years ago. Uh, it is like the block types endpoint. If you go to the rest API and examine the schema. So slash block block dash types, I believe is that. And then there's also some PHP stuff uh, to do that. Great question though. Anybody else got questions? Nope. Keep, keep rolling. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah, let's look at some code because we talk about a lot of stuff. Let me do a quick time check too. All right. We're at, all right. So sweet. Still got a half an hour. That's perfect. That's perfect. So I got a lot to look at today and definitely as I'm going, ask me questions, ask me for, you know, if there's any, any way I can tailor this to make it more useful to you, happy to do so. So I figured we'd start by just looking at uh, this example uh, site that I have. Um, and so again, like this is the example block that I created using just WordPress's default create block package. Um, and so pretty much what you saw, right? We're, we're importing these text controls, which are really nice. The WordPress component library is pretty cool. Let me see if I can actually open that up because that's somewhat neat to look at. That was a few slides back, wasn't it? Oh, wow. Way back here. Yeah, this is kind of neat. Um, so it's all in Storybook. Uh, let's see. And so you can, you know, use any of these things and import any of these different like components. Um, and it's it's nice. It's nice. It's well organized. There's a bunch of stuff in here. So you don't have to feel like you need to make your own editor controls if you're doing custom block development, because most of the time what you want is going to be provided for you. And it also, again, uses that same visual language as Gutenberg does. Um so I've got that here. And then again, this is sort of what the ACF block looks like. So look at all these files that I've got, right? I've got block.json, I've got an edit.js, I've got an editor scss if I want to style the editor. I've got index, which just sort of registers all the stuff. Um, and then my save.js and style.js. And like, you know, there could also be a view.js. So like this can get kind of complex. Um, and so as much as I like this in terms of flexibility, it is an involvement to do all of this stuff and de to develop that way. Um, and if we look up here at like ACF blocks, for example, we can see that those are much simpler. We just got this ACF block dot JSON, got testimonial dot CSS, testimonial dot PHP. Um, and now the PHP file is obviously a little bit more involved and that's sort of how ACF blocks work, right? Is they're, they're sort of PHP based and were made as a nice on-ramp to do block development for people who didn't want to buy into the JavaScript e ecosystem. Um, but so if you're familiar with PHP, all this stuff is really nice and easy to do. You just kind of, you know, echo out your HTML and, and what you want that to look like. Um, and then I actually found a tool, ACF block CLI tool that I've got a link to at the end that'll do some of this for you and like stub out an ACF block really easily. That's kind of neat. Um, okay. So both of these things exist there. Let's pop back in here and let's, let's take a look. So we looked at the custom block example. Um, and that looks as you'd expect. I can do my color picker. I can edit my message. And each time I update that, that's going to save. Um, and then my ACF block is, 
Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh, no, I broke something on the ACF block. So we're going to bail there. Um, I was trying to play around with some, some different stuff and it didn't work well. So that's my fault for switching. But let's check out GraphQL real quick and, and see what we get. Um, and so here again, I've got a, a version of that same query that I can run in my GraphQL graphical interface. You can see here that I've actually got my custom block. Um, and so, you know, it's really nice to get to pull this stuff out and like, say I wanted to, I don't know, I guess like, right. I'm using a list. I also maybe want core, you know, I get this nice autocomplete if I want to do like core list items. And then I don't know what those would be, but let's see what attributes and just start typing. I don't know, say font family or whatever. Um, so that's the benefit of GraphQL, in my opinion, is as we're constructing these queries, we get this really nice autocomplete feature in here. If I want to go look at the docs and see what different, you know, attributes are on this thing, like I get this nice explorable interface to say, okay, well, I guess, yeah, on this core list item, I probably would also want content. Um, so we'll include content, font family, all of this different stuff, um, styles, whatever. So we get all of that stuff provided for us out of the box. Um, and that's with this content blocks plugin, right? And so I'm over on our faust.js.org Faust .js website. And I'm just gonna open up a couple of those docs to just sort of show you where you would go and get started with this stuff if you wanted to. Um, so I believe right now the content blocks uh, extension is really only available via GitHub. You can go and download the latest release and you just upload it to your site that already has WP GraphQL installed. And then you sort of get all this stuff out of the box. Um, and there's a nice, you know, walkthrough here that sort of tells you how you can make these queries for different blocks um, and, and how you would go about sort of reconstructing that block hierarchy using those packages. Um, but I also talked about the rest version of this. So that's like how you would do this. Oh, thanks, Terry. Perfect. Um, let me copy this site. I think I can go back to this rest slide actually. Uh, here, yeah. And so if I just copy this URL, this is what it looks like to get REST data out of here. Um, and I think, come back in here, what, where are we at? So we want this 16, get our database ID. So it's just, you know, a custom endpoint VIP block data API, V1 posts. Um, and then we just come in here and post our post ID and send that and that's what we get back, right? So it's a little bit simpler, um, which I think most people who are still using REST to do this stuff, that's what they want is they just want the data. They don't, they're not worried about the type safety and that's to totally, totally up to you on how you wanna implement that. But here we got the score paragraph example um, in the drop cap. We've got our custom block and those custom attributes that we set on that block. Um, so that's base the basics of getting the data out um, but that doesn't sort of close the loop, right? Because now we've just got a bunch of data. And so we need to do something with it. And if you look at like the automatic version, they've got kind of a simplistic example of like how to map this stuff. Uh, there, let's keep going. You know, they've got this kind of simplistic function to map a block to a component. But in reality, it's way more complex than what's here, right? We've got to deal with the inner blocks. Um, you know, obviously there's way more types of blocks. And so that's where the Faust team created these two packages called uh, the Gutenberg blocks provider and the, and the blocks viewer. Um, and we use these things in conjunction. Um, and I'm going to show you how they work inside of the Faust framework, but I believe these are just React components. So if you were working in any other React based environment, I think maybe Remix like Astro, some of these other frameworks. Gatsby probably, uh, you know, I, I don't know, should should work fine. Um, and I'd love for you all to go out there. And if you are doing any of that, test it out and let me know. Um, sorry, my bit, and I'm reading Andrew's question. My biggest problem has been getting the blocks consistently in case users change the order of blocks. Is there a way to configure a unique ID to the block so that we can clear, query one block from our component? Um, what... Let me see, change the order of blocks. So should that not, in our, what, are you using the WP GraphQL content blocks package for that or are you using the older one? Maybe, and maybe I'll show you how this works and then you can you can tell me if you still have a question. 
um, cause this should be ordered for you. Like it should, once we, once we do the flat list the hierarchical, it should come back in the right order. Um, and if not, then maybe we got a bug, but yeah, so let me, let me shift gears just a little bit and pop open my Faust, uh, template. So I've got a bunch of stuff here. I'm just inside of this Faust demo project. And so Faust, for those of you who don't know, is uh, WP Engine sort of take on Next.js, right? This is a Next.js meta meta framework for helping people do headless WordPress sites. So there's a bunch of affordances in here that exist that kind of help you bridge the gap between Next and WordPress. Um, and so one of those is that we implement, in, at least in the pages directory version of this, we implement the WP template hierarchy using this WP templates directory. So what I've got here is just a single .js file, and this is where I'm gonna be doing the bulk of my stuff. But there are a couple of other things that we need to sort of be aware of. We've got this WP blocks folder, which is a convention. It could actually be named anything else. Uh, just this is entirely up to you, but what we do. Um, and then we made some changes to the app.js file. And so there, we're gonna NPM install these packages, and then we're gonna use these things in conjunction uh, to basically help you map all of those blocks directly to components. So the first step of that is in that underscore app.js file. We're gonna come in here and uh, we're gonna implement this WordPress blocks provider. So this component is basically, for lack of a better word, the rest of our app, right? We have this Faust provider that provides some data to the rest of our app. Then we've got this component. Um, and so we're gonna wrap our component uh, inside of this WordPress blocks provider. And then what we're doing is we're just importing all of our React block components directly in there, right? So we're, we've got this index file where we're, we're exporting all of these things and then we're just importing them all uh, into that provider. Um, and we'll come back to the WP blocks directory in a second. Okay, so that's that's step one, right? We've got to have this WordPress blocks provider. That means that anywhere sort of downstream of this, you have access to those blocks. And then when we use the blocks viewer in uh, single.js, all that stuff will already be there for you. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, I'm gonna switch gears and we'll talk about that for just a second. We can see here that I'm importing a couple of different things um, from some of those packages. The first one is I'm importing this flat list to hierarchical function. Uh, from Faust core. And then I'm importing the WordPress blocks viewer um, from my blocks package. And then also right here, I'm just importing the components again, and I'll show you why I'm doing that in just a second. Um, and then this is what uh, the basics of a Faust template look like, right? So anytime you go to a URI or URL um, that, that resolves to like the single.php, um, it's going to load this template for you. And when it loads this template, it's going to load and run this particular query. So we've got this, this, this is the component that's going to get rendered as a part of the template. And then this is the query that gets run and passed into the component as props. So, right, we, we go to slash blog slash, I don't know, example. And let, let me actually just run this up and I'll, I'll show you. That might be better than me talking about it. Um, okay, so now if I go to localhost 3000 and then click on this custom block example, you know, we'll get this and you can see here that it's sort of, you know, it, it resolves all those possible templates for us for that particular URL. And, you know, it, it walks the hierarchy just like we would in WordPress, right? So we don't have this, we don't have this. So we find single.js, which we do have. And then behind the scenes, it runs this, this query that's attached to our component. We're getting you know all the stuff we need to populate our page. Um, and down here, you can see we're getting all of that sort of same data that we were getting on our editor blocks query and graphical. We're getting right here. So we've got editor blocks, flat equals true. Um, we're always gonna wanna get the rendered HTML of a component because the way that the block viewer works is it's, it's really like an opt-in mentality, right? So I get the rendered HTML of all my components. And what the block viewer is gonna do is as it reconstructs your content, it's gonna look to see whether or not you have a custom block provided, right? Because we may not wanna rewrite all of our blocks, like the paragraph, the paragraph block, fine. Like I keep that and I don't need to do that. 
And what the block viewer does is if you don't have a custom block defined in this directory, it just falls back to the rendered HTML of a particular component. So it gives you sort of the default view where we were just echoing out post content. But then if you do have a custom block specified, it'll use that to render that instead. So it's really flexible in that way. Um, and you can obviously like, um, you know, th hey, thanks for joining. Um, and so really flexible in that way, totally opt in for you. Um, but I do want to make a call out uh, about these two things. So uh, as I make this query, I'm going to specify some aliases for the client ID in the parent client ID. And let me go back to graphical and like, let's talk about that for just a second. Cause I do think uh, that's important. Let me scroll down to where I've got my core list example. And so what that does is that the, the client ID and the parent client ID create this child parent relationship. Um, so we can see here, we've got this core list block that's coming back in, in GraphQL. Um, and you know, that obviously contains other blocks, right? It has inner blocks, it has list item blocks. Um, and so what the client ID and parent client ID allow us to do is then to go back and reconstruct that. So you can see here that this parent client ID on the list item block references the client ID of my core list. Same thing with this one down here. Um, and then obviously it has its own client ID because it itself could potentially have uh, inner blocks or child blocks. So that's sort of how all that works. And I'm just aliasing these two things in my query uh, because the the Faust blocks viewer package expects them to be in this format. Um, so I'm aliasing them just as ID and parent ID. Um, and then here I am, as you can see, like I'm just sort of, you know, making the same query that I've got over here. Uh, but one of the sort of conventions that that we can do with the WP blocks package as we create our custom blocks is that we can co-locate our fragments in there if we want. Um, and obviously if you just wanna have one long query here, that's totally up to you and how you wanna do that. Um, but you know, that's, sorry, my camera got a little fuzzy. I'm gonna just keep moving. I'm so excited to talk about blocks. Um, Sorry, bad bad jokes today, everybody, bad jokes. But we can also co-locate our queries. So if we look, open up this headless, uh, my, my custom headless block file, we can see that this is what it looks like. You know, we're, we're importing React. And since we're co-locating our query here, we're using this GQL formatter from Apollo client. Um, and then we basically just export a component. So we're exporting this um, and we're, we're kind of keeping the name the same. Then we're also setting this display name, which is important again, because that's what this sort of taps into as it's looking at the type names. And this should generally match the type name of the block that you're trying to match uh, in your GraphQL sort of return data. But you can see here, I've just got this, uh, you know, this, this convention for us co-locating these fragments. I have an object with an entry, which is a GQL formatted fragment, and then the key. And then basically up here, Inside of my query, I just, you know, echo out this entry, interpolate the entry inside of this template literal. And then I use the, the entry down here using the key. So it allows me to keep my code a little cleaner. And if I don't want to have, you know, just fragments all over the place, um, I don't have to, but that's totally optional. If you want to, that's up to you. You don't need to do this part um, as long as the data is getting returned in the the query that's attached to your page component, it doesn't matter how you do that part. So I just wanted to illustrate, it's kind of a choice you can make if you want to sort of co-locate stuff. Um, and if not, uh, you can do it this way. Okay, so now we're getting all that data, right? And then we can kind of see, uh, where are we at? Down here, right? Where we start to use some of that data. So again, the way that Faust works is we have these templates, right? And when we get to a URL that hits on one of those templates, we execute this query in the background, and then the result of this query gets passed in as props. So basically that's what props contains, is all of the stuff that came back from our GraphQL request. Um, and here we can see us using that. So we've got props.data.post, uh, we're pulling some stuff out of there. Here we, we destructure the editor blocks, um, you know, which is gonna be this basically uh, for that post. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of transform that from this flat list into a hierarchy again. 
And so we just pass those editor blocks into this flat list to hierarchical function. And if you used a bunch of WP GraphQL, that's used a couple of other places. Like I think with menus and certain other places, we do something similar. Um, and so there we're just, you know, transforming that into blocks. And then what we're doing down here is um, we're just implementing our WordPress blocks viewer component and passing those hierarchical now blocks into that component. Um, and then, you know, that gets rendered. So we can see that's here. And like, so if I come back to my posts, if I come to my custom block example and I make that, I don't know, red or whatever, and click update, all that data sort of flows through. Um, and then we can we can make really easy changes uh, just like that. Because again, if we pop open that that particular file, you know, we're taking in those attributes as props and then using that attribute color uh, right there to set that inline style. And sort of what you do at that point, up to you, how you want to make your components. Like, do you want to use some other styling format like that? that that's entirely on you, how you want to do that. If we change the message, um, same deal. Now, so this is an entirely custom block. But we can also override core blocks by just creating, you know, the type name component. And so like for this example, I've created this basic core block um, and say I wanted to, I don't know, I wanted to make my own custom paragraph block. I can do that by creating this component. And then I'll just come over here and remove this comment. Uh, save that. And then if I like refresh this, yeah, it does it automatically for me. And we can see that it's applying those new styles for me. Um, okay. So where are we at on time? 48. So we got about 12 minutes left. Um, I think that kind of covers most of the foul stuff that I wanted to show. Um, now I do have a bunch of, like I said, kind of hot take on the horizon stuff, uh, that I wanted to talk about. So like I mentioned this upcoming, these upcoming changes to WP graph QNLs ACF. So, uh, I'm going to drop this in the chat. This is kind of a neat pull request that I'd go take a look at. Cause this is really like, we're getting really close to rounding this piece off and I'm super excited. Um, but this, this um, again, add support for getting those field types into your blocks, like so that you get type safety across all that stuff. Um, and it's also adding support for the options page UI. So if you have like global site styles that you would typically save in an ACF options page, you can, you should be able to, once this stuff's done, um, pull all that stuff out via GraphQL and, and have that be awesome. So that's one of the things. And then let me pop back into my presentation real quick because I just want to make sure I get all of these. So there are a couple of limitations and complications that I think are worth mentioning, but also some cool things that we can look at for the future. Um, so one dealing with rich text in either scenario is still complex. Uh, like I think we had in this paragraph example, right? The content of a paragraph isn't just text. It could potentially be HTML. And so right now there's not a great way for us to reach inside of potential rich text content and like parse that into a syntax tree. That's something that's definitely on the horizon, but it's one of those blockers for people who are using things like next, next JS links or link prefetching. Um, that's still kind of tough. That's something that is both a limitation of WP GraphQL content blocks and a limitation of the automatic uh, block data API thing if they, if you read into that. Um, now, if you store those things as fields, like, you know, you get some flexibility there, but, you know, anything that's got rich HTML can still be rich HTML. Um, and so it's kind of tough to reach in there. That's one of those things that we kind of need to think about. Um, another one is like the idea that maintaining blocks and components can be cumbersome and duplicative, right? You've seen, I've got like stuff in my WordPress backend, stuff in um, my React Next.js front end. And there's sort of like a one-to-one -one comparison. So the Faust team has an open re request for comment RFC proposal on, uh, so, you know, some, some helpers, some methods that we can use to maybe reduce this duplication. And so what this is kind of is um, 96, 95% of my hopes and dreams in that PR. I'm glad we could get you 95% of your hopes and dreams. That's fantastic. Um, Jason, Jason's an absolute, just fantastic human being. Um, and so this is, sorry, and sorry to sidetrack, because this is really cool. And this I want to talk about too. And and so this is obviously like, Faust is sort of thinking about how, how does Faust help us 
solve this duplication problem? Can we use the React component as sort of a source of truth for creating WordPress blocks? And that's what this kind of register Faust block helper is, is exploring. Like, how do I just use give it my React component in a block.json file? And then I tell Faust to handle the rest for me. And it sort of does that stuff on the back end. And that to me is mind blowing. That's like the holy grail. And once we get there, like it's going to be a whole new ball game because that just reduces so much work and having to maintain these two things. Um, we've already seen like there are multiple different ways to approach creating custom blocks like ACF, but this would be a really cool one for people who are in the JavaScript space. Now, when we pair this, I don't know how many of you all have seen this thing, the V0 from Vercel. They just launched this today. But this is basically like a generative AI component builder, right? So I go in here and I say, I want a tweet UI. I want a, a pricing page. I want this thing. And it builds them using Tailwind and Shad UI. And so like, I think about using these two things in conjunction in the future and just like how quickly we'll be able to rep out just some amazing stuff. Like, oh, hey, I want, I don't know, like, yeah, I want to tweet you out. I want a cookie consent banner. I want this other thing. I'm trying to find a, like a good WordPress block. Not None of these are great. An FAQ section. I want a WordPress block FAQ section. Like, oh, cool. You have the AI create this com React component for you. You click into this. You, you know, install it via NPX or copy paste your code in here and port that into your application. And then you tell F Faust, hey, register this with my WordPress site. And all of a sudden, in like two seconds, you've got this really complex, nice development set up. Um, so that's going to be cool. So blocks obviously are React only. And that's definitely what uh, most of the, pretty much most of what the Faust block work is trying to uh, target is React only versions. Uh, so conversion between other frameworks like Vue or Svelte, it's going to be a little bit more involved. And I'm hoping like this is one of those things that long term, I think AI should be able to help with as well. Um, there are also many other types of blocks that I've talked about, like reusable blocks, which are actually becoming patterns, uh, dynamic blocks, with PHP templates, and some of these will have slightly different um, behaviors. Uh, and one of the other things I'll, I'll sort of tease a little bit is the idea of interactive blocks. I don't know who's heard of the interactivity API that WordPress is introducing, but it's almost like they're writing their own Alpine-like JavaScript framework, and I'll sort of just show you uh, what that kind of looks like uh, in a basic way. Um, and so this is sort of like an, an example of what the interactive block is going to look like. Like it would give you the ability to, inside of your block markup, write these different directives that tap into uh, some state or actions. And, and like, you know, you get this kind of like, Re like, I don't know, JavaScript framework like experience uh, on top of WordPress blocks. Um, so I don't have a ton of time left in the presentation, so I'm not going to deep dive into that. But this is something I'm looking at. Like I made it work in Astro already. And so like I can run this NPM uh, run sync blocks and it's basically going to pull a bunch of data out of my WordPress blocks and like, you know, use it in the, in, in the WordPress front end. So there's some cool stuff on, with that on the horizon. Um, but it's something we're starting to think about now. Um, I mentioned full site editing a lot. And I think we have an experimental community version of the site editor. And so like, there's not great examples on this yet, uh, but but David Levine uh, whipped this up. He's just a great contributor to the WP GraphQL community. Um, and I'm not sure if this still works with the current version of content blocks, but I think once that's stable, his idea is to add this sort of right on top of it so that if you want to use this with a full site editing theme, you can do so. Um, and then that obviously introduces a whole different slew of types like template templates, template parts, um, more things become blocks. Like there's not really this concept of menus. Uh, there's more than navigation blocks. So a whole different ball game. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is there, if you are into the ACF block development world, this is a pretty cool CLI. Uh, so I'll throw that in the chat as well. Um, so if you're doing ACF block development, like this seems kind of handy, and it'll just really quickly stub out uh, the ACF block uh, files that you need to get rolling. And I think I did that in, 
one of these examples. Let me see if I can. And I think here, yeah, the CLI block is how this sort of stepped out. So, you know, really nice to get moving quickly, gets you everything that you need. Um, and then you can be off to the races. So awesome. I, I appreciate everybody hanging out. Um, what kind of questions y'all got for me around any of this stuff? Or things that, you know, you're still struggling with that we could help you work through. I got a couple of shameless plugs at the end too. So if you haven't, obviously, um, WP Engine, we're going all in on the headless thing. And we have our own ho headless WordPress hosting platform. It is called Atlas. Um, and if you go to developers.wpengine.com slash docs, uh, you can learn all you need to know about that and get started pretty quickly. We've got full stack blueprints that you can spin up, but you can also bring your own stuff. Um, so definitely give that a check. Uh, check that out. Please do that. You know, obviously the commercial aspect of this is part of the reason that we're able to do so much good work in the open source ecosystem. So I really want to see this be successful. Um, and then shameless plug number two, please join us in discord. Uh, this is like a headless WordPress uh, mastermind group, if you will, We're about 1500 people strong now, which is crazy. When I started here, uh, I guess almost two years ago, um, we, uh, we, we had about 400 people. So lots of growth. So we got a question from Andrew. Will Faust use React server components? And if so, how, how do you envision that work with pulling Gutenberg blocks? Would you pull them by page or on a more granular level? Um, I think that, so to answer that question, yeah, let me go back out to the Faust repo. Cause the answer is yes. I mean, eventually we are definitely going to support, um, the React server components and the app router. Uh, and we actually have an RFC open and for that particular thing. Um, and then I think there might actually be some PRs. So there might be, so there's an RFC here for that if you kind of want to read up on their current thinking. Um, and then I think, let me go back here. There might be like an experimental release yeah, experimental app router. So like you could actually go and play around with it. Some of this is, and this is reworking um, a lot of the data fetching uh, to work in React server components. It's also re reworking a lot of the auth stuff to work with React server components. So we're definitely tracking that. I think as soon as it's stable, like you'll see some more stable releases. How that works with Gutenberg blocks. Um, you know, that's a great question. I think that's kind of up to like how you want to handle it and, you know, I think you, there is a scenario where you could have each block kind of like request its own data. Um, that kind of might be overkill. Um, but I think there will be a lot of flexibility there. And honestly, I think we'll see a lot of performance improvements uh, to the next just general ecosystem when when we're when we're all using React server components. Um, and like, what do we, would you pull them by page or more granular granular level? How do we handle edit previews? Um, that's a great question. Uh, Faust does that out of the box using a plugin. Um, and so like if I come, do I have Faust installed? That's a great question. Let's look over here. I think I do. Um, sorry, got too many tabs open. Um, but essentially Faust implements its own sort of headless based authentication method. Oh man, where am I at? Edit post. Okay, here we go. Yeah, and I should have Faust installed. And so like if I come here and I guess let me do a new new thing. I mean, and the answer is, is like if you use Faust in the Faust plugin, um, I don't really have to think about too much. Uh, something's jacked up. Of course, of course. Let's see. Query paran for previews, which it does. Okay. And we've got a bug. We so there's definitely a bug in here that we've got and know about with WordPress 6.3. Right. Um so oh, that shit. I wonder if we R previews. Yep. Um, and so oh. that was accomplished using the demo. Okay, you trust me, thank you. Yeah, go check it out. Um, and maybe if we update, they might have fixed it. Um, but yeah, we noticed that the other day they changed, they changed how that preview, because we're tapping into that. Gutenberg doesn't give you a way to actually filter the preview link, which is, you know, their own thing, um, which they should. 
because there's a regular hook to do it. Um, so we had to actually tap into the JavaScript UI. And so I think that that's what that is. But out of the box, it shouldn't. And then the other thing I'll leave you with is like, so um, let me just redirect here. If you want a better understanding of like how Faust does that, read this post where I basically deconstruct it and do it in Next, or sorry, Nuxt, in Nuxt, the, the view-based framework. Um, I'm using that same backend plugin uh, to you know implement the same method of authentication that I do in the other one. Um, great question. Anybody else questions, comments? How can we help? Things you'd like to see. I know we're at time, so feel free to start bailing if you want. Um, the recording for this will be up on YouTube uh, probably in the next day or two. Um, so definitely check out the recording there. Um, I'll drop some of the links we explored today in that YouTube description so that you can find it. Um, but thanks again, everybody, for coming. And like I said, anybody else last minute questions? Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate it. Great. Yeah, great seeing everybody. All right. Yep. Sounds like, sounds like we're good. Questions going once, going twice. All right. Rock on. Please join discord. Yep. Join our discord. We would love to have you. It's a great place to ask any further clarifying questions or even just chat with other devs who are doing the same thing. All right, y'all. We'll rock on. We'll go ahead, stop the share, shut her down. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Have a Happy Thursday.